This is the Leadership and Insurance Podcast, brought to you by FinPro Search Partners. Insurance companies are businesses and they need to look for the long term and be sustainable. We went from zero to one and now it's going from one to a hundred. Insurance as, as a concept, as a kind of service, is brilliant. The execution is what we're looking at now. I think the companies that are going to succeed are the ones that are going to understand and master the art of intent. When we talk about innovation, we lean too heavily to think about technology and we don't think about creating a culture of innovation. I think innovation is essentially continuous improvement of existing processes and platforms and product, right? It's got to be easy. It's got to be seamless. Hello and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance podcast. Um, this is your host, Alex Bond, and I'm very lucky today to be joined by Denise Garth, who is Chief Strategy Officer at Majesco. Um, Denise, thanks for joining me. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm all right. Although, as you can tell, I'm a bit, I'm a bit shiny. And we were just sort of doing that bit where we do when we're British in the summer and we moan about how hot it is. Um, and then we complain that it's not hot the rest of the time. So it's one of those particularly hot days today. So other than that, I'm very good. I'm very good. good. Um, I've wanted to do this for a long time uh, because if I started reading out your accolades as like 50 most influential people in insure tech, uh, top 100 people to listen to in endurance, or I think we'd be here for half the recording. So um, yeah, I'm really grateful that you've had to, some time to find uh, with us on the podcast today. But for the people that have been under a rock forever, um, as is customary on the podcast. It'd be lovely if you could introduce yourself and, and obviously Majesco for anyone that doesn't possibly know who Majesco are, which I think will be a small part of our audience, but you never know. So, um, you know, it's Denise Garth. I'm the chief strategy officer at Majesco, also responsible for our marketing at Majesco. And I've been here for over nine years now. Um, and it's been really part of a transformation. My background is, is I was in, uh, I've been in insurance my entire career. I was in, in, in inside insurance companies, um, both on the business and the IT side, uh, the first 20 plus years. And then I moved over to Accord for about Eight, eight, nine years there. I went to an in, uh, another technology vendor that also did BPO. And then I became an industry analyst uh, with Strategy Meets Action for a couple of years. And then somebody who had hired me um, into a previous job called me up and said, hey, Denise, do you want to have lunch? And my husband said, oh, you know what this is about, Denise? And I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> So he pulled me into uh, into Majesco, and uh, we had just done uh, one of our first acquisitions um, of Coverall at the time. And over that course of this uh, period of time, we've done a number of acquisitions. We've been bought by Toma Bravo, one of the uh, premier private equity firms. Um, it'll be coming up on four years. Um, and we have completely transformed um, our solutions in, in addition to the acquisition of a number of our uh, other solutions. So it's really a, a really strong portfolio of what I like to say our next generation um, business solutions for insurance that really, um, um, first of all, are native cloud, but have a lot of other attributes that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, so that's kind of the background uh, for Majesco. We serve both the property and casualty and the life and annuity market. Um, we have core solutions for both. We have loss control, digital solutions, distribution management, uh, underwriting platform for uh, group and work site and benefits. So it's it's a wide range of solutions that quite frankly, really does follow the end-to-end -end value chain. And it really gives us an opportunity to work with customers depending on where they wanna start their transformation or where their pain points are that they really want to do something and re then really develop and, and build off of that relationship. Amazing stuff. Uh, yeah, that, that lunch conversation. Um, I love those. That, that's our biggest competitor. Someone getting pulled to lunch by someone they used to work with <laughs> in the search industry. <laughs> um, we, we, yeah, it, it is funny. I was, someone said to me the other day, what's your biggest competition? And I was like, the networks of individuals. I mean, always. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we're adjacent to that. Um, I um yeah I wanted to start with core systems because you know we, we you know, it's, it's no secret that we obviously have a pre call to talk about it and I was really intrigued by the way that you really broke down how you think about core systems of you know Majesco and what makes up the dimensions of the products for you today because I just love the way you articulate it so kind of clearly and so distinctly when we spoke not putting you under pressure because you got to do it again now <laughs> <laughs> no, I got to do it again now. Um, <laughs> 
I think, you know, when I think about core systems, um, you know, you think about it in terms of policy billing and claims. That's really, that's really what you've got, but you've got to, we think about it much, much broader than that. Um, so maybe if I could kind of back up, because I think to put in context of what I think core systems are today, you need to understand why they have to be different. So I think from an insurance industry perspective, we're at an extraordinary crossroads. Um, we've got all kinds of pressures. Uh, there's a lot happening. If you want to talk about climate change, you want to talk about increased risk, you want to talk about a different changing set of demographics of buyers. There's all kinds of pressures that are really, I think, signals for insurers to say, step back. We got to rethink your business operating model and your technology foundation to remain relevant um, and leaders in the market because everything around you is changing. And that in itself should, should, should suggest that your business model and your technology foundation has to change. So with regard to technology, you know, we have accumulated uh, what I like to call legacy debt um, over decades. And it's not uncommon to have systems out there for 20, 30 years. And that's an off balance sheet set of technology work that has to be addressed because um, it, it, we haven't really managed it well. We have just kind of put, um, you know, pieces onto it to try to make it as effective as possible. But ultimately, it's a hamstringing um, insurer's ability to compete. So what we're seeing now um, with all the, the really challenging financial and market dynamics is that profitability and operational costs remain the top two um, uh, mind of issues for insurers. And to compete, not just today, but in the future, um, expecting anything, any value to come out of legacy is really going to be, is is really um, kind of a, a pipe dream. Um, because mm -hmm. if you're stuck on that legacy, and I call even on-prem modern systems, we, you know, in the last five to 10 years, everybody was going through a transformation project. They implemented a new core system. And it now is legacy because number one, it's on-premise, it's not in the cloud. Number two, um, they highly customize it, so it's very difficult to upgrade. And now what is happening is that insurers are not boxed in. It's limiting their potential. And so I think for leaders, market leaders, to really seek operational effectiveness options and to capture, um, you know, the intellectual knowledge and the, and, the, and the information that is part of the organization, it's unique to the organization, um, they are going to have another challenge, and it's the retiring of employees. We think about um, core systems have to be what I call next gen and intelligent, and it has to be really be built on a different type of architecture. So the key components include a cloud native architecture that you really leverage that full potential of cloud computing to make it scalable, to make it containerized um, so that you can really um, have elasticity and, and automation that allows you to kind of shift as the demands in the marketplace shift. It's gotta be open API standards. That means it, it can seamlessly integrate with your internal systems uh, with a robust library of APIs, but more importantly, you can actually integrate with external systems. So other insure techs out in the marketplace that have really unique capabilities that you wanna be able to leverage to create different kinds of experiences or to do some type of um, you know, data and analytics. Um, it's gotta be headless architecture, meaning that it allows you to have flexibility and adaptability to stay ahead of the, the com uh, competition. And then you got microservices. Um, that's really important because everything can kind of come down to microservices and it really allows you to have kind of a DevOps and a infrastructure and a set of security that can really uh, be consistent and be managed much more cost effectively. But the most important piece that really, I think, differentiates this next generation of, of core systems is that analytic data and analytics are not an afterthought. They're not mm -hmm. a bolt. They're not a, mm -hmm. oh, let's do this now. No, nope. mm -hmm. get spotted as a foundation of, of, the, of the core. And so what we've done is we've embedded the data and analytics into the core. What does that mean? That means that now for the first time, um, our customers who have our core solutions have access to all of their data from that core system in mm. real time. It's put into a, a data lighthouse. You can add other data to that. You can uh, do other things with that. 
Secondly, you've got business intelligence. Remember, business intelligence was the hot thing the last 10 years. You have these BI reports that can give you a dashboard to tell you, you know, what's your business looking like? How many claims do you have? All of that kind of stuff. That was kind of like an add-on too. Nope. We've mm -hmm. embedded it into the workflow. We've embedded it into the core so that not only do you get the out-of-the-box dashboards, you can actually create your own dashboards if given the authority to do so. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. If I'm a claims adjuster for a certain line of business or for a certain region, I may have some really unique stuff that I want to see a different type of dashboard than my peers do to, so that I can manage that portfolio business in a very different way. Then you've got the um, AI machine learning models. Um, there's some great partners out there that we've got partners that we're um, integrating and embedding those um, uh, in, within our core, but we have built our own models as well. And that needs to be a part of the business process. So whether it's underwriting or it's claims um, or it's billing, you can leverage those models to be able to um, drive better decisions and to have better outcomes, business outcomes. But the most important piece and all of those other components of the architecture are really based on, uh, have to be in place to be able to leverage this is Gen AI. What Gen AI can do is it can really allow you to drive um, what we have not seen since we start, first started automating back in the 70s and 80s is a level of productivity and a level of operational optimization and efficiency that we have not seen for decades. So what do I mean by that? If you've got Gen AI, um, what, the way we've used it is we've got Gen AI embedded. It's on every screen of every solution. And mm. what you can do is that I'm a new employee. How do I do an, uh, an amendment? How mm -hmm. do I do a quote? I can, um, all of our online documentation is in there. We've run it through an, uh, a, a, one of those large models and it can come back and it give you step one, two, three, four. And so for a new employee, all of a sudden your productivity is going to increase because you've got an assistant guiding you through the process of how to use the system. Second of all, you've got the ability to be able to use Gen AI to um, do um, some tasks and activities. Can you summarize my claims notes? Um, if you went in and tried to look at all the claims notes and try to manually summarize that, it could take you 20, 30 minutes, maybe more. It could be done in less than 60 seconds. Those mm -hmm. types of things are going to drive a 10 to 20 times productivity level that once you begin to build those capabilities in, all of a sudden you have a different operating model. You then all of a sudden have a different operational cost structure. And all of a sudden you have a different kind of competition from a product pricing perspective that positions you in the marketplace more competitively. And in my, in my long career, um, in uh, being in the in insurance industry the entire career, I've never seen this level of opportunity ever within our industry to have this level of real impact to the business and ultimately to our customers out in the marketplace. It's so exciting. I mean, just jumping in there with the, um, you know, look, not all carriers are created equal, um, but, and, and, and obviously people want different things from their systems. But, you know, one of the challenges of, of, of this conversation is always going to be the breadth of things that Majesco can do. But, what are the things that they're most interested in right now? What's what's the, you know, when you're having those carrier conversations, what seems to be front of mind for, you know, thematically of all those things that we've kind of broken down and covered off, what are they focusing on right now in 2024? I think um, everybody's focused in on their operational costs and their product uh, and their profitability. I mean, mm. particularly on the PNC side, if you're yep. on the line, annuity and health side, it's a different because high interest rates are driving increased um, interest in products. Um, mm. Although on the group and benefits side, it's a little bit more challenging because people don't have as much um, income. So there mm. may be, you know, selecting fewer benefits. So the, the, the financial and market dynamics have a different kind of aspect. So I think when you look at it, um, it it's different for different organizations. And, you know, one of the things is, is that PNC insurers are trying to cut costs. We've seen some layoffs in the marketplace, um, kind of unheard of in, in some cases. Um, you've seen a change in cutting of budgets. You can't cut your way to, to growth. You can't mm. cut your way to, you know, you can cut to profitability, but you're going to cut off your, uh, your nose to spite your face. At mm. some point, you're going to have to start investing this. We've waited too long, and now we've got this um, accumulation of debt that now is really kind of having a big impact on our bottom line. 
I think Alex, if you kind of go to um, AM Best Innovation Scores, and they had a report come out in May, and they actually for PNC they actually highlighted where those that had higher scores of innovation, there are actual be financial um, benefits to having uh, invested in new technology and innovation to the wow. tune of better operating costs. You've got, a, um, you've got decreased um, uh, combined ratios. I mean, there's, you have better growth. There's all kinds of real financial data now that's kind of starting to come out that shows that that investment does have a, does have a value and does pay off. We uh -huh. just haven't made those decisions to do so. Um, uh -huh. And I think that depending on what lines of business, uh, you know, insurers have, their priorities kind of change and where they're at in their own transformation journey. But I can tell uh -huh. you, we still have a lot of legacy debt out there, even the mm -hmm. big teams, because yeah. they got a different system for every line of business. Well, I was going to say that it's, it's something we've talked about before, but life insurers are are they much more challenged by legacy tech than, than just by the nature of their businesses? Is, is, is it a bigger problem there or, or, or is that something PNC likes to tell itself? <laughs> I think it depends upon the organization. I think PNC mm. can still be running old, you know, 15, 20 year old systems too, particularly yeah, some of the smaller insurers. Um, but life insurers um, tend to have them for 30, 40 years because it's hard to take the business off the book when you've got a, a whole life policy or universal life policy sitting out there and you're waiting for the person to die 50 years later. Uh -huh. um, you know, and, and typically, once again, those systems were very, very um, customized and, um, you know, lots of customization done to them that you can't really upgrade them and it's hard to convert them. Hmm. The, the the data question, you know, we're talking about Gen, I, Gen AI, we're talking about kind of analysis of data. Um, you know, the state of play generally, like, and they even access the data at the moment, you know, like how bad is it for some of these people? Because I, I remember this is, it wasn't even that long ago, me doing a horrifying search in the claim space and, and I put someone into a very large reinsurance business and they were sort of saying, where do they get their updated claims data? And, 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 uh, this person who was head of Europe um, and, and he said, he phoned me up and said, Alex, you would not believe where we get our claims data from. And at the time they were getting it from the broker because uh, basically the system wasn't capable of pulling it out uh, efficiently. And now that was 10 years ago. So I suspect that's very much an outdated thing. But, you know, can people access the data in the way they want? And and then I suppose where I'm going with this conversation is, is that how big is the challenge is it getting up to speed? Because it's all right to get new tech and go forward and say, right, we can collect data from this point onwards, but can they even access the data they, they need to kind of make that transition effective? Uh, there's a real problem with data um, and having mm -hmm. access to the data, but even the bigger, um, bigger issue is the quality of the data. Is mm -hmm. the data of any quality um, uh, um, within it? So, if you're talking about legacy systems that are 10, 15 years, you know, or more older, um, more than likely you have limited access to the data, mm -hmm. um, and um, you're trying to write all kinds of extracts to get that data out into a data warehouse, into a data lake. Um, but sometimes you may not be able to get um, all of that data. Even some of the modern systems, I would say up to, you know, three, four or five years ago, you only got access to the data that the vendor allowed you to have access to, you know, based on whatever they built an extract for or based uh -huh. on whatever their data architecture was. Uh -huh. um, today, I think, you know, if you are really building out a, uh, a new solution into that next gen architecture, you should have access to all your data. So if you're looking at a solution and you can't have access to all of your data, that's your most important asset as a company. Mm -hmm. You need to really kind of reconsider is that solution and its bells and whistles that much more important than having access to your data. And you've got to have somebody who, you know, if you've got quality of data um, and somebody who's really responsible for that and you can really make sure that the system that's producing that data um, is, is accurate, that's even more important because bad data in is bad data out. And I think that's been one of our biggest challenges as an industry. Could you really, um, could you really rely upon some of the data from a mm. quality standpoint? Mm. What do you think all these data demands mean for um, 
the industry from a talent perspective you know do, do we need obviously from a tech perspective we need different skill sets um but even just kind of looking at the underwriters the, the claims professional or is it is it less that we need different skills but but the training has to change you know the emphasis on data the, the, the importance of data and and, and 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 the care therefore of being like custodians and good custodians of that data clearly has to change so i don't, I don't know whether it's a skill or a, or an emphasis of training or, or maybe it's a bit of both but i kind of wanted to get your thoughts on how this changes like the roles of people within insurance i think it changes it a lot i think that you know we as you move into solutions that can really automate far more using, say, a gen AI to do things much more efficiently and effectively, um, and you have the technology that can really automate it, what you want are, you don't want people who can just do, um, you know, run the process and manually do it. And then maybe you do something off the side and you kind of come back in and you data key it in. You want somebody who are knowledge workers that are gonna be able to make decisions in the process. So if I'm a claims adjuster and I'm looking at the information, how do I get that summary? How do I bring up a dashboard to kind of assess it? How do I run a model that can assess um, um, you know, the adjudication of, of stuff, um, litigation possibilities, subrogation possibilities. Um, how do I kind of manage that portfolio of business differently? And so I think what all of these technologies, in particular AI and Gen AI, are going to do. It's going to make. Um, it's going to give people on the front lines the information they need to be able to do their their work much more efficiently, but more importantly, much more intelligently. They can make better business decisions on behalf of the company and on behalf of the customer. And so I have no fear about this. I know that there's a little bit of fear out there. It's going to take away the jobs. You know, that's kind of, you know, some of the, 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 the conversation out there. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's going to just provide more insights to, um, for the knowledge worker. It's going to make it more um, valuable. And quite honestly, when you look at this next generation, they want a job that's going to be um, something that's of value, something that's meaningful. We have one of the most important industries that's really meaningful. It puts people's lives back together. It puts um, people's businesses back together. It helps to protect. It's it's really the underpinning of of lives and of businesses and of, of economies. It's it's really an um, uh, 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 industry that's really, really important. What better opportunity for this younger generation to be part of something that is really important to the livelihood of businesses and people? Mm. I agree. But well, you're preaching to the choir here. I, I I think it's really funny when um you know we we you know we were a business that specialises in insurance and insure tech space and um you know we've actually onboarded a couple of new people this week and and it's quite interesting seeing the cogs turn when they they're in it a bit longer and and then you know Callum is a one of my colleagues been with us six months now and 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 now he's kind of coming back going oh, i saw this thing on the news and i realized what the impact it would be and then he was like and then he was asking me about well, you know, what, what, what do you think the impacts of reinsurance would be and and it was really interesting to see how kind of interweaved it was with society and 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 that's with that's looking at things just from a kind of claims and interest perspective but then when we started digging into kind of you know bridging the gap in kind of coverage and uh you know and that and and, and all those good things and we, we we probably don't do a good enough job at selling that externally um so i no. do think that's interesting I mean, and, and the other thing that I think is interesting that we don't do well enough is that, you know, you've touched on it here. We do a bad job at talking about the exciting things we're doing with technology. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, AI is the buzzword at the moment. There's all sorts of different applications, but actually real world applications, really kind of meaningful applications. I wouldn't say they're few and far between, but what I mean is I, th I think some of the hype, a lot of the hype is about stuff that's kind of doesn't matter. But what we're saying is that insurance does matter. And then the application of Gen AI, Gen AI and, and it, it there is really important. What I wanted to kind of ask you from a Majesco perspective, why is it important that Gen AI is embedded? Why can't I get a bolt on off the shelf solution that offers something else? Um, yeah, why does it have to be part of the suite of, of, of my existing products? It makes it, um, it's, it's Gen AI. There's a difference between AI models and Gen AI. Mm -hmm. AI models can be a bolt on because you're going to do um, you're going to look at data for a subrogation pro uh, element. That's one little part of an overall claims process. You can kind of uh, you can kind of integrate that in. 
Gen AI is really an end-to-end -end process. It's not just about a point in time, because if you're going to be ad adjudicating a claim, there's lots of different um, processes that you're going to go through to be able to manage that claim. It's not going to happen in a once and done type of thing. It's going to happen over a period of time. So you've got to kind of think about it on an end to end basis and you got to have the consistency of the information and the data that you're using. It's, it's embedded within that core system that you're actually running those natural uh, language uh, models against. Um, and so I think that that's the big difference. I think both are needed, um, mm -hmm. but they're needed in different ways. So I don't see Gen AI at this point as really a bolt on um, because if you can say, I'm going to do it, we actually had a customer at our product council and they were seeing live demos of our um, intelligent core and they have policy and billing, but they don't have our claims. And they were so excited. They said, oh, this is going to be so exciting. And, and, they, and I said, yeah, what are you going to do when all of a sudden you get from policy to billing and you got all that intelligence and then you get over to claims and you don't? And he goes, oh, crap, um, you know, because all of a sudden it changes you know, how you're going to train a whole different set of people within the services department and the different solutions that they've got. Um, and I think it changes the conversation as to, well, I want to be in the policy department because that's going to be a lot more uh, easy to work with versus maybe the claims department. Mm. It's just, it's going to be different. Mm. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I think that's why I was teeing it up because I was like, the perception is that you could just plug these things and, and, and it's like, no, it, it, it's not, it's not end to end. So like it needs to talk to each other. It needs to kind of have this cohesive overview that, that goes between these. Yeah. It needs to be trained. I mean, and I think that's, that's the challenge for leaders at the moment as well is, is, you know, you're a leader in an industry that you understood completely. And now you have to be a leader of a technology business at the same time. And you need to understand it well enough to go, well, what are my, what are my solution options and, and, and how can I apply this in a way that's meaningful um, and, and efficient um, because otherwise it's really easy to, I mean, the amount of AI driven solutions I'm being offered at, at the moment in my industry is hilarious. <laughs> um, I know almost all of them are bad. I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and I love trying these things and, uh, you know, I've been involved in some of the R and D processes and been part of product councils myself mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it's what's interesting there is it's quite nascent. So there's a sort of lack of understanding of like even what we do for, a, you know, we kind of point things out and go, that's not actually how this process works at all. So we're going through the, the growing pains there. Just to add to what you said, I think, you know, because there's such a rapid adoption and experimentation of AI, machine learning and gen AI, mm. um, I think what's happened is that data and analytics is no longer just a long term strategy. Uh, of incremental investment. Um, it's a near term reality that really requires a much more broad holistic approach to data and analytics. So that if we are going to add, add things on over time, we have it based on an overall strategy and not just, oh, let's try this. Oh, let's try this. And it's just a patchwork of stuff rather than an overall foundation that's built upon that's going to be really solid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, quite. I mean, I, th I think that's I think that's where we were coming from it because, you know, thinking about our tech stack, you know, people think, oh, it's recruitment. You pick up the phone and you've got a black book of contacts. And it's like, yes, true. But also we have a huge amount of tech. I mean, it, and it is quite funny because I've been doing this for 20 years. So it's absolutely true that it was a phone. It was a phone and it was a bunch of contacts. But now it re re very much isn't that. But the problem is it, most of it is not holistic. So people are offering you solutions and it does one thing but it doesn't talk to all these other things that we do. And we don't even get me started about LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn, if, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're someone like me, you will have three different systems on LinkedIn and none of them talk to each other. Um, and then, you, then, you, then they wonder why you're not happy when the price goes up every month. But anyway, uh, let's, let's hope my LinkedIn account manager just doesn't see this because it might go up more. Um, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I think as, as a sort of final question that I wanted to ask you is that it's, all, it's great to talk about these things and efficiency and, and, and in, in, in abstract terms. But have you got any, and you know, I don't know how much you could share with this, but, but you know, real world advantages that, that some of your clients have, have demonstrated to you from these embedded offerings and you know in terms of i don't know what the what the outcomes they were looking for but what what have they been able to kind of share with you in terms of what's been delivered by these products so i'll talk about a few things a few different dimensions in general so we've um we've just recently helped um a uh, a startup for 
um, specialty car insurance for classic cars. Um, it's public yeah. open road. They were able to bring up our um, complete suite along with a digital front end for agents. I think, I think it was less than six months. So wow. they're backed by private equity. Um, you know, they're able to bring their new products to market into multiple states and they're going to have a continued rollout in that. So that's really around kind of speed to market aspect. Yep. And, and, and we've done that with existing carriers who want to kind of stand up a new line of business as well. So it doesn't just have to be an, um, a, a startup. I think then you look at um, some of the things that we're able to do um, as it relates to, say, loss control. Um, working with some large property um, insurers, you know, in different parts of the world. Um, they've been able to identify risk that maybe they were unable to see prior uh, to using the, the loss control uh, solution that we have, because we've got a database of properties that have been analyzed, um, hundreds of millions of data points that we're able to kind of um, look at that. And it can really assess that um, much greater. And then you look at say, um, the embedded intelligence. Um, you've got, uh, say, for example, um, the the first draft of um, refining a claims uh, claims notes. You can have a 94% um, um, you know, improvement in, in, in efficiency. Or if you look at, for example, billing, you've got um, change in the due date. 72% efficiency, uh, putting a policy under notice, another 72%. Or if you look at policy, um, you can um, um, uh, do a cancellation or reinstatement at 88%. All of a sudden, we've actually measured this stuff. You've actually been able to do some things at a, at a level of efficiency. Um, so instead of thinking about replacing legacy and getting rid of the old technology and the costs associated to that, um, think about how it can change the business, how you can get products to market quicker, how you can better assess and, and, and manage risk or prevent risk. Even with mm -hmm. loss control, you can use those loss control reports to be able to go and work with the customer to say, if you did this and this and this, you could reduce your risk. Um, you know, yeah. So you're helping to prevent the risk. Or in uh, from an underwriting standpoint, how you can better underwrite using some of the AI models. I think that the opportunity there is 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 a pretty broad perspective. So when customers, in fact, I was just on a call last week with a customer, potential customer, and they're trying to put their ROI together, you know, their case for why they need to mm -hmm. replace a, a piece of core system. And they were doing all the traditional things. And I started walking them through. Think about the productivity from um, embedded Gen AI. Think about the AI uh, ML models that are embedded. Think about access to your data. Think about how it could actually help improve your AM best innovation score. And then ultimately how that can impact your operational costs, your uh, combined ratio, your growth, all of those types of things. And all of a sudden they kind of begin to kind of change their mindset as to how do I kind of justify this? So it's not just about a reducing cost in one area. It's about a much bigger picture. Does that make sense? Mm. Of course it does. Of course it does. But you're a brilliant salesperson, so I, I, I don't know if I trust you. I am. Um... <laughs> no. Everybody's a salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> I know. When I started my first business, and 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 I, my my mum, this is my, I was in my thirties, but my mum still insisted I spoke to my uncle because he's a very successful businessman, and he went. Alex, as soon as you know that it doesn't matter what you do as an industry, if you're leading it, you're selling it all the time. So, uh, yeah, no, and, and I always mean that as a compliment. So, look, Denise, you've been really generous with your time. I've wanted to do this for a long time. For, so, so thank you so much for spending oh, some time with us. thank you. I know you're a really busy person, and um, and you're the only person that seems to go to more conferences than me, so I'll probably see you at the, the, the next one, which will, I don't know, ITC, are you going? I presume you are. Yes, I'm going to ITC, and I'm going to be going to the NAMIC annual as well, so a few conferences coming up. Great stuff. Well, I hope I get the pleasure of seeing you in person again. Um, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thank you.